So you hear all these numbers being thrown around. It's kind of difficult to really comprehend the extensive damage that is caused by this typhoon. Uh, take a look at these before and after pictures of Tacloban. These are just incredible. This is just before the typhoon struck. These are from Digital Globe, the uh, Colorado-based private satellite company. They switched on its cameras above the city. You could just see for yourself here the devastation that was caused by this typhoon. I mean, it just wiped out this city. You know, before the storm, this was actually one of the fastest growing cities there in the Philippines. It was also having an improved economy there, reducing the poverty level. You know, there's been a lot of talk about the slowness of the relief effort and the looming possible health crisis. Let's go to Ben Smilowitz, executive director of the Disaster Accountability Project here. He's joining us. Shed a little bit of light on the relief efforts. I think to an outsider, they look at this and they see some of the video coming out of there. Day one looks like day seven in a lot of places. There's not a lot of change. Why does it take so long? Well, it's heartbreaking to see. And on some level, this is to be expected. And on other levels, we don't really know yet whether this is slow or not. It, it's really early in, in, in this relief effort. And you know, people want to help. And they're, they're donating dollars to, to organizations that they, that they hear, that they see on TV, you know, asking for money. And none of those dollars are even anywhere close to the Philippines yet. They're, the money is not even getting there yet. Well, no, and, that, and that's to be expected. I mean, these organizations, many of them are in the U.S. They're, they're still figuring out their deployment strategy. Um, unless you're donating directly to groups in the Philippines that are actually on the ground already, then, then it takes a while for, for that, those resources to actually make it. You know, we've been through this so many times in the last few years. I mean, the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, the botched response to Hurricane Katrina. You would think by now that groups would better pre-position their resources. The typhoon was forecasted for days in advance. Why not more people on the ground there getting ready for this, getting the people ready for this? Well, and, and there hopefully is some improvement, and, and you would think that there would be improvement over time. The problem is, is that the groups, regardless of their capacity to deliver services, are raising money. And they're saying donate, donate, donate. And that doesn't mean they're actually able to deliver services, or they've even worked in the Philippines. So the question for most donors should be, whether or not an organization actually has capacity to deliver services, and then what services they provide, and are those the services that are, that are needed? Are you saying some people are taking advantage of this situation to raise money? Totally. I mean, I would say that after a disaster, for a lot of NGOs, not all of them, these events are like adding fish food to a fish tank. You see all the fish coming up. Some of the fish you've never even seen before, but they, all of a sudden they're showing up for food. Some organizations are doing great, great work, and some are completely opportunistic and, and don't belong in the Philippines. Um, and the question for most donors should be how to sort through them. And, and that's really what we try to do at Disaster Accountability Project. Let's bring into the conversation right now, if we could, uh, Dr. Ronald Wallman. He is president of Doctors of the World USA, also a public health expert at George Washington University. Thank you for joining us. I'd like your response to this. I mean, why would we've learned that the health crisis will just continue to grow the longer and longer we wait for help to get in there? Why aren't we pre-positioning these resources better? Couldn't that save countless lives? I think that um, many of the organizations do have the capacity to deliver uh, appropriate services and commodities as quickly as possible. There are organizations that, like my own for example, that have been working in the Philippines for many years that partner with Filipino organizations as well. We have a, f a cargo plane carrying 40 tons of, of, of equipment and medical supplies and medicines to the affected areas right now as we speak. We work off of funds that uh, are basically in the bank that, you know, and we do seek obviously additional funding for major events like this, but we have reserves and we have people who are professionals on a full-time basis and on a year-round basis. And it's not just us, there are a number of organizations who do that. So I think that having a professional core of responders to these emergencies is quite important and we have seen indeed improvements in our understanding of what the difficulties and the problems are in the health sector in the different phases of disaster response and we've improved our ability to respond to those problems as quickly as possible. Ben, would you agree on that or are we seeing some improvements? I, I, you know, it, it's hard to say. We had Katrina, there was massive devastation here in the U.S., the Haiti earthquake only a, only a few years ago and half the money hadn't been spent after a year. Um, organizations that really didn't belong in Haiti were asking for money and raised millions of dollars. Um, some organizations, I'm sure, are improving. I, you know, it, it's hard to speculate when, when, you're not, when you don't have enough data, and I don't think anyone right now has enough data. Yeah, who's to, watching the hen house? I mean, does there need to be bigger oversight when these disasters happen and, and everyone is out there asking for money? 
Tremendously, and, and that, that's why I started the Disaster Accountability Project after Katrina, and we're an independent watchdog, but no one really wants to fund watchdog work. They want to fund food and water and medicine, which I totally understand, but even 1% or a, a, a fraction of a percent for independent oversight would do tremendous wonders for helping the public make more informed decisions about where to give. I want to ask you about the public health crisis right sure. now. We're moving into day seven. Sure. You know, day eight is just mm -hmm. around the corner. Sure. Is this a ticking time bomb? The longer we wait here, we've got a lot of diseases that are going to crop up, aren't we? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I think that history and experience teaches us that perhaps it's not a ticking time bomb. Obviously, the clear requirements right now are for food, water, improved sanitation facilities, and shelter for people who have lost their homes. The destruction's been enormous. This is an exceptional event. And uh, we, we, all of those things that I just mentioned, food, water, sanitation, and shelter, these are the key foundations of, fundament, uh, of preventive medicine. Getting these areas covered as quickly as possible is going to go a long way to reducing the risk. Take the Haiti earthquake that you mentioned, the 2010 earthquake, a phenomenally important event, but with no real uh, major epidemics that uh, came immediately in its wake. People know that there was a cholera epidemic in Haiti, but mm -hmm. it was divorced from the earthquake event itself. We know that uh, you know in the, after these natural disasters, although the risk is appreciable, in fact, epidemics of infectious disease do not usually tend to occur. There are exceptions, but by providing these basic requirements of life and restoring the infrastructure, we can bring the health situation to relatively normal in the acute phase. That's not to say that there aren't longer term consequences. Many, many people having lost their homes, having lost family members and relatives will suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome, for example. Final That's, thoughts here yeah, as so we wrap this up. What do we need to do going forward? What, what, what do we need to focus on? We need to get on the ground, provide the basics, make sure we're getting information systems set up so that we can take, so that we can detect the occurrence of uh, adverse health events as quickly as responsible and, to, and respond to them. And starting now, we need to be looking forward to the future, to rebuilding the health system together with the Philippines Ministry of Health, with doctors, nurses, health professionals on the ground, and providing people with the opportunity to move forward and restore their lives, regain their livelihoods as quickly and as a, possible. And a word of caution, Ben? Yeah, well, I would say make sure you know who you're donating to. I would say that um, making sure that the dollars go as quickly as possible to, to Philippines organizations that actually have on-the-ground capacity and can not only use this money to, to stay strong through this, but also um, improve disaster relief in the future in the Philippines. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Ben Smilowitz with the Disaster Accountability Project. Information online on that. And Dr. Ronald Wallman with... Uh, Doctors of the World USA and George Washington University. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much you. for thank you. Us. Well, our coverage of Typhoon Haiyan continues Sunday night. We have a special report, Typhoon Haiyan, Philippines in Crisis. America Tonight's Joey Chen will be in Cebu Sunday at 9 o'clock Eastern Time.